Good evening and welcome to the Commemorative Air Force Warbird Tube webinar for this evening. I'm your host, Steve Buss, and we're joined tonight by Charles Scott Williams. And uh, he's going to share his experiences flying the airplane we're looking at on the screen there, the Supermarine Spitfire, a uh, bucket list airplane if there ever was one. And of course, the debate always is between fighters, which is better, the Mustang or the Spitfire? And maybe we'll find out a little more about the Spitfire and you can make your own uh, decision as we go through the presentation tonight. As we go through the presentation, if you have any questions uh, about flying the Spitfire or about uh, Scott's career, just uh, go ahead and type them in the chat box and we'll save some time at the uh, end to uh, answer those questions. And uh, joining me right now, uh, Scott, welcome from uh, nice warm Texas, uh, nice Wednesday evening. Glad to have you with us. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, let's uh, set up the uh, the background, your background a little bit, some of the, the different aircraft you've flown and and tell us how you got involved in aviation to begin with. Well, I started uh, second grade. I always loved airplanes, and uh, I ended up joining the Civil Air Patrol in North Carolina, where I grew up as a cadet. I was there for five years. I soloed when I was 16 before I could fly a car, uh, before I could drive a car, and uh, I got in the Air Force as an air traffic controller for four years, and in my off-duty time, I flew in the Air Force Aero Club and got all my ratings before I got out, and then I... Uh, Got myself into the commuter airlines and uh, got on with a major airline in 1987. And now the end of the trail for the airline industries, the light's getting brighter at the end of the tunnel. But, uh, you know, I've always wanted to fly warbirds and uh, the Spitfire we're talking about tonight is a few warbirds, the P-51, the Mustang, the C-46, the B-17, the B-18, and I'll soon be flying the S and J. Um, anyway, it's it's in my it's a disease. It's something that uh, that you just can't shake, man. You know, that's just how it is for me. That's true. That's it's that way for a lot of us. And the the, uh, the picture in the in the center on the top, that's uh, you flying uh, in the B seventeen Texas Raiders. Yes, sir. Uh, I've been with the CAF for three years, and uh, I started. I'm on the uh, B seventeen. I've checked out since in the Beach 18, the C-45, and I'm soon to be uh, flying the SNJ. Uh, I didn't mention the the photo on the left is the L-39 uh, Albatross. I flew that as well. It's a you know it's a Warsaw Pact advanced jet trainer from the Cold War era. And uh, the Beaver, the photo of the Beaver was up in Alaska with the Civil Air Patrol. I was a 757. 767 co-pilot at the time with a lot of layovers in Anchorage. So uh, I walked down to, to Merrill Field from my hotel and switched my membership from Texas to Alaska. So I was in the Alaska wing of the Civil Air Patrol living in Texas for, I don't know, five or six years. It was a blast. You had kind of an interesting story about uh, uh, landing the, uh, the Beaver, if you'd care to share. Oh, yeah. Uh, one thing... Folks, those of you are, that are listening, if you're a fixed wing nose gear person, uh, a, a tail wheel will humble you quite uh, rapidly. I was checking out in the in the Beaver and uh, I greased on the mains. And then when the tail wheel touched down, I was slightly yawed. And the, the shimmy from the tail wheel was so bad it knocked my feet off the rudder pedals. So I was congratulating myself with that nice smooth landing until the tail wheel hit and then it humbles you, so you 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 always have to be on your on your toes and never let your guard down flying at any tailwheel airplane, in my opinion. But uh, Andy, the, the instructor told me uh, after I did finish, he said even the East German judge would give you a nod on on the last landing that I made. <laughs> and then the the uh, photo in the uh, lower left hand corner that's that's you in your own airplane. Yes, sir. Uh, it's a uh, Cessna 310, an I-model from 1964. And uh, yeah, I bought it. Uh, my excuse for buying it was my daughter at the time was a gymnast, and I figured we could get to gymnastics meets all over all over the place without having to worry about getting bumped. As, a, as an airline employee, we travel free, but it's if there's seats available. 
So I figured I was always the number one guy on the seniority list in that airplane, and I'm never going to get bumped. So, yeah, it's a it's a good machine. That's great. About how many hours do you have uh, total in your logbook, or actually logbooks? Uh, twenty eight, twenty eight thousand, right at twenty eight thousand eight hundred total time. Um, I spent almost seven years as a flight engineer. I got about forty two hundred hours that uh, doing that uh, on the A three hundred Airbus. And a little, just a touch uh, on the Boeing 727, uh, on the MD-80, all the 737s, the 100, 200, 300, 500, 700, 800, 900, 900ER, and max, and I've flown the 7576. I think that, that sums it up in the airlines. Plus uh, some nice Warbird time as well. Yes, sir. And honestly, at this stage of the game for me, I'm looking forward not to wish my life away, but I'm looking forward to uh, to spending more time with warbirds. And I've got a an eight month old grandson now that I, I I just can see him joining the CAF for some reason and learning to fly. You know, that's just me though. That's yeah. awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the airplane that you had the the pleasure of flying. Uh, not only uh, flying the Spitfire, but also flying it in England. But let's talk a little bit about the uh, the history of the the Supermarine Spitfire itself. Um, it was designed by R.J. Mitchell. First flew in 1936 at a time when when looking at an airplane that had retractable undercarriage was a was a unique thing. Uh, I know that R.J. Mitchell was a pioneer with this with this beautiful airplane, and it was obviously at a time when England needed it. I mean, they were literally the the corner they had they were backed into by Hitler was the North Sea. That's all they unless they wanted to go for a swim in the English Channel. Uh, so the Spitfire came around just in time for the Battle of Britain, and we we discussed it before before we came on the air here with everybody listening. You know the the pretty girl gets all the attention and of of the Spitfire and the Hurricane. You know, uh, to me anyway, aesthetically, I think the Spitfire is one of the most beautiful planes in the world. But the brunt of the uh, of the defense of England was the was the Hurricane simply because it was the main mainstay of the force at the time, and the Spitfire was a new kid on the block. But from a, uh, a kill ratio, the Spitfire fared a lot better simply because of its performance. It was it was uh, it was on par, it was an equal with the with the 109. It, it, with one, we, with the exception of one thing, and that would be the early model Spitfires and their carbureted. Uh, they had a float uh, type carburetor, which was which was taken care of later on with modifications. Uh, the plane could not do negative G's without losing power. That was it, one of its Achilles heels. Uh, and the other, the other big issue with the Spitfire is the fact that, that with its normal fuel tanks that sit forward of the of the uh, cockpit, you're only carrying eight, 85 gallons of fuel for an engine that's 1,650 horsepower. That doesn't that doesn't go very far. We're looking at uh, some historic images of the uh, Spitfire in the Battle of Britain, and uh, you mentioned the uh, the uh, fuel capacity and the limit of uh, a range, but that was uh, supplemented by the, the folks that we see here in the picture, and that is the uh, early adoption of radar, which allowed the uh, British ground uh, controllers to vector the, the Spitfires and Hurricanes to the enemy without them having to spend a lot of time aloft waiting for or looking for the enemy. Yep, uh, you know the radar. Radar was a big thing. They could see the Germans coming and and give the Spitfires enough time to scramble to defend England. Um, and on the same around on, along the same lines as the Falklands War in 1982, when England went up against Argentina over the the Falklands, same kind of thing. They were using Harriers to defend the fleet. The Argentines had to fly a long way just to get there to fight them, and and back in the Battle of Britain in 1940, it's the same story. All you know, the Germans had to come across the Channel and bring it to the English, and uh, you know most fighter planes, including modern fighter planes, they're out of gas before they take off because they just don't carry that much fuel. 
And uh, the Spitfire, it can carry external stores, external uh, fuel tanks with varying amounts, but you know, it just didn't have the range. But since the Germans were coming to England to attack and bomb and blitz, uh, the Spitfire was perfect for that scenario because, you know, the Germans get shot down. If they're lucky, they land in English territory and they get captured and spend the war in a POW camp, not not treated badly at all. If the if the Germ if the Brits got shot down, they landed in Grandma's garden and uh, dusted off and and got another Spitfire and went back to work, you know, to defend England. Uh, the, you know, the radar very very important. A lot of uh, just in, in general, a lot of things came about. Uh, because of radar, what we now call chaff, the British called window. That was their nickname for all the, uh, you know, it's like uh, metallic, almost like tinfoil that's dropped out of the airplanes. And it literally blocks the radar signature from, from uh, tagging a target and giving the enemy range on a target. Same stuff used in Vietnam by the F-105s. They would just drop this stuff and and basically put a curtain between the enemy's radar and where they were flying. So it would blind them temporarily. It, the, uh, that's, the, the chaff is almost the original uh, origination of stealth technology is being able to dis disguise yourself from, uh, from radar. And of course, you, you, we're mentioning uh, range and uh, drop tanks. And of course, one of the uh, maybe not lesser known, but uh, more curious uh, operations for the Spitfire, <laughs> uh, the uh, the beer runs that they made after the uh, landings in D-Day, and they actually, if you can see that picture, that's two beer kegs uh, underneath <laughs> the uh, the pylons of the airplane. And they actually flew beer uh, across the channel. They'd climb to altitude, get the beer cold, and then come back in and land. And uh, one of the pilots in uh, his autobiography, and his name escapes me at the moment, but he said it was the most stressful landings he ever made because he knew everyone on the airfield was watching because if he botched the landing and heaven forbid, one of the, uh, one of the kegs fell off and <laughs> broke open, they would lose all the beer and he certainly would be a persona non grata on the, uh, on the airfield. So uh, defense of England uh, on the serious side, but you know, a beer run, well, you got to keep the soldiers happy, right? That's right. I mean, there's another story about a Spitfire pilot, Douglas Batter. In fact, when we, my wife and I were on vacation in England, that's when I flew the Spitfire, of course. And uh, our cab driver was taking us to Biggin Hill. And they had recently moved the, this, the Spitfire, uh, the heritage hangar there, to a different location. So he wasn't familiar. So he stopped and asked a, a gate guard at another commercial building near the airport where the hangar was. And he said to the guy, he says, I've got Mr. and Mrs. Badder with me. Where is the Spitfire hangar? You know, but the man knew who Douglas Badder was. And those of you that are listening that don't know the story of him, that in itself, I've read the books about him. He, uh, he was called the Legless Ace. He flew a Spitfire and he had crashed before, he had been in a crash before the war and he had lost both of his legs. He had artificial legs that were made of tin. And there's a very famous phot photograph of him swinging one of his legs up into the canopy of the Spitfire. And uh, he, he set the example. He, he actually took over a Canadian squadron that was uh, not, not the best place to be. And he whipped those guys into shape and made them into a good fighting unit. But unfortunately, he got shot down. One of his legs was jammed in the airplane, so he just disconnected it and jumped out. So his leg, one of his artificial legs was in the crash. The Germans went and tried to get his leg out of the crashed airplane for him, and it was it was beyond repair. And they actually let a, uh, a RAF Lysander, it's a single engine uh, courier airplane, they actually let them drop a, a, an artificial leg down so that Batter could have two legs again. And, and being the good fighting Englishman that he was, like any fighting man or woman, you make the enemy expend as much of their resources on you as a POW as you possibly can. And he promptly uh, tied some bed sheets together, shimmied out a window and took off and escaped from, from prison camp temporarily. But that's Douglas Batter. 
Yeah, an amazing individual. And and you mentioned uh, Biggin Hill and that the uh, heritage hangar. We're looking at a, a photo of that as uh, right now. Uh, what's the what's the story behind Biggin Hill? It was not only very pivotal in World War II, but also uh, before that as well. Well, my knowledge of Biggin Hill is from what I read about the Battle of Britain. It it was a a, a pretty big fighter base for the RAF. That's I wish I had something deeper to tell you, but that's what I know of it. And for me to go there, if you're going to fly a Spitfire, where else can you where else can you go to really want to to sense the history of it? And that's what it meant to me. I've got enough flying hours. I'll give some of them away if you want some of them. It was the quality, uh, the historic value of what I did and where I was. Because I'm telling you, I was walking in some pretty big footsteps there. You know, walking around that airfield just uh, just to be there to me was incredible. So tell us a little bit about the uh, airplane that you flew. The the Spitfire that I flew obviously wasn't originally designed with two seats. They modified the airplane. They moved the forward cockpit up, I think, 13 inches, and uh, to allow for the center of gravity limits. Uh, for that aft cockpit. Both cockpits had fully functional controls. And uh, for me, if I couldn't fly the airplane, I wouldn't have spent the money or gone to England to Big and Hill to do this because I wanted to say, and, I, and I've got it in my logbook that I've flown a Spitfire. That means a lot to me. It's a, it's kind of a, like you said, a bucket list item. Um, uh, gosh, you know, we, we, we just did a normal takeoff. I did not take off or land the airplane because if you look at the landing gear in the photograph that's displayed, you'll see the pivot points are close to the center line of the airplane. The P-51's gear is different. It's pivoted to where it swings from the uh, the outward edge of that, that wheel well. So you have a wider gear base. That was one of the issues with the Spitfire. It, uh, with that narrow wheel base, and if you ever look at an Mission Smith 109, it's the same thing. It's very narrow, so not as stable as something with a wider wheelbase, like a P-51 or a BT-13 or, or, or even the, the AT-6 isn't really all that big, but it's better than the Spitfire. Um, 1,650 horses, if, if memory serves. Um, I think they had taken out the, the 20 millimeter Hispano cannons on this one to put fuel cells in the wings so it would have more range. But it still had the Browning 303s in the wings. Um, just talking about the airplane in general, I, reviewing systems, the, a lot of our British airplanes use pneumatics to power some of their systems, which is to me kind of unique. The brakes are pneumatic. They call them landing lamps instead of landing lights. And they're pneumatically actuated. The guns are, the guns are charged pneumatically and the flaps are pneumatic. The brakes are pneumatic. I think that covers it. The the raising and lowering of the landing gear is hydraulic. And um, for the emergency gear extension, it's the CO2 bottle. It can you put the landing gear lever down, and then you actuate the the CO2 canister, and it and it literally forces the gear down with uh, CO2 pressure. Uh, Rotol propellers, if memory serves. Uh, Vickers struts, uh, a Merlin engine, 1650 horsepower, and some unique things about the Spitfire that generated a, a lot of pioneering in the area of plastic surgery is the fact that that 85 gallons of fuel sits in front of the firewall in the in front of the cockpit. So, as the Brits would say, if it if the fuel tank was set alight. In other words, if it's shot and catches on fire, guess where the flames are going? You're going to be, you're going to be front row in the barbecue as a, as a pilot. And unfortunately, as a result of that, a lot of the, the RAF pilots were burned very bad. And uh, they sustained a lot of horrific burns. And I don't recall if he was Aussie or, or a New Zealander, but he was a pioneer in plastic surgery. And uh, they put these guys in the hospital. And I spoke with a, a, a guy that flew the Spitfire up at Oshkosh. 
and he told me the story. He said uh, a lot of the nurses were very, very good looking nurses to help these guys literally get used to being around people. Another one of the things that he did, not just physically for these pilots, he he had them, uh, he talked to the families in the local area and had them over for Sunday dinner. So they could enter, they could start interacting with people again, families and, you know, I mean, you can imagine how they must have felt their their self-esteem with, with these horrific burns. But the man was a pioneer in plastic surgery and he didn't help these guys just physically, he helped them mentally as well. So that that's another off another offshoot of what the Spitfire created during the war. Well, of course, uh, this would not be possible, the, the flight that you took without the uh, the support of your, your wife and family, of course. Oh, yeah. Yes, my, my wife, the poor woman, she's uh, she's been drugged to so many air museums. And uh, she helped me study. She helped me study for my flight engineer written exams. She still remembers systems of the Boeing 727 for that test, and she can identify a lot of airplanes that most people in this world would never even have a clue about simply because of me never shutting up about airplanes uh yeah my wife i got a wonderful wife and the only way i leave her is in a body bag so you know i'm i'm just a real lucky guy um she's tolerated my my disease of aviation since we've been married and this uh the, the flight in the spitfire was actually wrapped around a, a vacation as well Yes, sir. We we went to England. Uh, we actually stayed in London within walking distance of the eye, the big uh, Ferris wheel there. We walked everywhere. We saw all the stuff that you see, you know, the changing of the guard and, oh gosh, London Bridge, the Tower Bridge. We took a ferry boat down to Greenwich, which again, if if Scott Williams can find something about aerospace anywhere, he'll find it. So I ended up buying a book about Yuri Gagarin at the museum. The Russians actually gave the British a statue of Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, simply because they the time technology they needed for the space program was so important. So as I guess a good gesture, a nice gesture to England, the Soviets back then gave them this statue. And I read I read his life story on the flight back back home to uh, Houston from London. So, uh, you know, my wife, she she just can't get away from it. <laughs> well, let, let's talk in specifics about the actual flight experience itself. Uh, many of us have, have had an opportunity to do flight experience, whether it's the B-17 or T-6, BTs, some of the smaller aircraft, the, uh, the C-45s. Walk us through your experience with the Spitfire. Well, we, we get to uh, the hangar and uh, watch a couple of videos one one's on the emergency escape procedures for the airplane you know when you go fly on an airliner the flight attendants tell you where the emergency exits are and if we go in the water take your seat cushion with you or life excuse me life vest um, but you learn the emergency escape procedures in the spitfire um, that was one of the big things i met the pilot that i flew with and we he asked me what my experience was and you know, so he has an idea of who he's dealing with because he's gonna let me fly the airplane. And I was I'm I'm not shy about asking questions. Said I'm gonna get to do air do fly the airplane, correct? I just wanted to re-verify that before I got in the airplane. He said yes. I said, okay, great. So we chatted and uh the ground crew there, you know, in fact one of the ground crew members was interesting. He was I don't know if he's still with us today or not, but he was he was a child during the Battle of Britain. So he was actually there during all that stuff. It was nice talking to him. And then the, the other end, this photo you're showing right now, there's a kid standing in, in front of the canopy there. And he was just, he was 17 or 18. He was, he was doing what our cadets do in the CAF. They're hanging around airplanes or soaking it up as much as they can. But they were, they were on the spot with the, the ladder getting you in the airplane and uh helping you get set up and strapped in um you know the the plane had flown a sortie before i got there so the engine was warm there was no need to to let the oil pressure and oil temperature and all the the 
the indications for the engine, they didn't need very long to warm up. So it was a pretty quick taxi. Uh, taxiing out, one of the things I say in the article that I wrote was that the, the gear was pretty stiff. The, uh, the struts were pretty stiff. We, we hit a, a lip on some of the asphalt going on the runway and it was pretty good, pretty good little jolt, more than I expected. Um, the flying, we, you know, the takeoff, I can't really, I can't really compare it to what happened in the war because just like the B-17 Texas Raiders that I fly, we don't push this thing up to, to the, the power settings they use in a war. These engines are old, the airplanes are old, we're, we're babying them as much as we can because we want them to last. It was no different with the, our British cousins across the, the pond there. They, he took off with less than full power, and, uh, but still, it, the plane doesn't waste any time getting off the ground. Uh, went out to a practice area south, south of the field, southeast of London, and he let me have the airplane. He says, just go ahead and make some turns. So I, I start off with shallow turns just to get the feel of the airplane. Then I went into steep turns, about 60 degrees of bank, and I wanted to do aerobatics. He says, well, we want to keep it below two Gs. So he demoed an aileron roll for me, and then I followed suit and did the same thing. One of the photos I have, uh, my, in fact, it's my favorite photo. Is, it's, there's a camera mounted in the cockpit behind my head. And uh, it's, it's when I'm exactly inverted. Uh, there you go. That's the photo right there. I love that photo. That's my flight helmet you're looking at the back of my noggin while I'm doing an aileron roll. It's kind of a, a cool thing. If you look to the left of my, my, my helmet, you can see the forward canopy slightly. And the, with the wider photo, you can see that the aileron's fully deflected. But uh, having flown, the, really the only thing I can fly, compare it to is the P-51. Doing a, a four-point roll or an aileron roll in the P-51, it's, to me, a much more uh, physical maneuver. In the, the Mark V Spitfire flight manual, they call aerobatics flick maneuvers, flick maneuvers. Literally, it's a flick of the wrist. Because unlike the P stick and flight control stick and most of other fighters like that, the stick goes all the way to the floor for maximum leverage. Well, the, the Spitfire is unique. If, if you can go back to the cockpit, if you look at the, it's a circular hand grip. It's, they call it the spade, I guess, because of a, like a shovel, a spade, the handle of a, of a shovel. But it pivots for roll just below uh, the top of the stick, maybe a third down. That's the only part that, that actually rolls left and right on the stick. And of course, when you pull, it's it's hinged there on that pivot point, but the pitch goes all the way to the floor. And and for the aileron roll, I pull back on the, on the spade, about 20 degrees pitch attitude and just a flick of the wrist all the way over and over she goes. Uh, in watching the videos, I timed the, the, the roll rate was almost 68 degrees a second, which compared to something like a T-38, which rolls at 720 degrees a second, that's very, very slow. But, you know, this was this was the top of the line fighter during that, that era and uh, well-balanced flight controls. And uh, the flying itself, you know, it was just, uh, it was it was very nice and it was the history of it. And one thing specific about this airframe, I was told that that airplane, that second day in service actually shot down a Mission Smith 109. So I'm flying in an airplane that served in the Battle of Britain, that shot down a German fighter. And, and I'm just, it's almost overwhelming how the, you can't soak up the history enough. You're at Biggin Hill, you're flying a Spitfire, you're doing aerobatics over London. It's, it's, it was fantastic, man, coming back. Um, I forget, we had traffic to follow and he let me fly back to the pattern and then he, the pilot took over and landed the airplane. You know, I wouldn't dare try to take this thing off or land it with that narrow gear, having never flown the airplane before. I, I wouldn't want to risk such a valuable piece of history. And uh, here we see your instructor pilot. Yes, he was a... Uh, former Royal Navy uh, Hawker Harrier pilot. Nice man, uh, 
he was very, very uh, kind to allow me to fly the airplane. And he actually said, you can see better out of the back cockpit than you can in the front. Uh, all I know is I felt comfortable with him. I mean, he was a, he was an airline guy. So, I mean, we're on the same wavelength. You know, one of the things I want to say, a lot of people have asked me this, uh, you know, you, you walk into a place with all this flying time that I have, and there's a lot of guys just like me. And they waltz into the CAF and they, well, I'm this, this, and this. Well, you know what? Flying a 737 or a 767, it's a whole different ball game compared to flying a B-17. You're dealing with a tailwheel. You're dealing with uh, manual controls. You've got a baby. These radial engines, there's so many things that you have to learn to do that are different from flying a jet around. Jets are Honestly, they're easy compared to this stuff, but by far, uh, you know, crosswind landings, your feet being awake when you land instead of just sitting on the floor like a lot of fighter guys are in flying jet fighters, you know, they don't even know what rudder pedals are, a lot of them. And you, if you don't know what they are in a tailwheel airplane or a light airplane, you better, you better go get a job at the library or something doing something different because you're going to run into trouble. As you well know, Steve, you, you know, you fly the Piper Cub and some other light airplanes and tailwheels. That is true. Uh, they will, they will, any of the, the tail draggers will, uh, will get you if you don't pay attention to them. And, but that's, that's part of the fun of it as well is uh, the, the challenge uh, that, that goes into it. So Scott, what are some of your lasting impressions from, from the Spitfire flight? Well, the, obviously the history, like I've said, just being at Big and Hill, I mean, how many people in the world get to do this? I mean, if you've got the money, you can do it, sure. And I had to pay for it like anybody else, but to me, it was worth it. I'm walking around in a hangar looking at a hurricane. I see they were restoring a Mission Smith 109 there. And you sit there and you look at this 109. It didn't have an engine yet. They were waiting on the engine to be rebuilt and I think sent from Spain, if memory serves. But you wonder, you know, these, these airplanes are sitting here, this 109, there's a Spitfire and a hurricane, you wonder if they were talking to each other, what would they say, you know? You know, it's funny, like, these old war veterans, they, uh, the war is over, you know, the, the fight's over, and, and honestly, they, you're all kind of cut from the same cloth, and they'd probably have a nice friendly conversation. They, they'd be glad the war was over and that they were friends now instead of trying to kill each other. I had a similar experience at work. Uh, you know, I was in the American Air Force as an air traffic controller. I was an enlisted guy, I wasn't a pilot. But at work, where I work for a major airline, uh, I'm, I go to work and my co-pilot's sitting there, he's got a German accent and he's about my age. And I said, so would you fly up fours? I thought he was West German Air Force. He says, no, actually, I flew the MiG-21. And I looked at him and I said, man, I'm glad we're working together in friends instead of on the opposite sides of a war if it had ever kicked off back in the, with the Soviet Union and the United States and NATO. But it's, I much rather would, would be friends with, with former enemy than, than having to try to fight each other. And I think in that hangar, those airplanes sitting there, the 109, the Hurricane and the Spitfire, I think they would have a similar kind of reaction. And the history of it, honestly, that flying out of Biggin Hill and flying one of the most iconic airplanes in the world, you know, the the Spitfire. That you can't you can't miss that wing silhouette. It's beautiful. And we just wanted to add some information here of uh, for anyone who's who's thinking about. Uh, uh, flying the Spitfire, uh, some information about the uh, Big and Hill Heritage Hangar, uh, some information as far as their uh, email address and, and website, in case you'd like to contact them. Um, with uh, COVID and everything that's going on, we're kind of uh, not exactly sure how their their flight schedule is going, but we check their website, and uh, if you're interested, uh, they they will uh, let you book a flight, and they'll get back to you when uh, they can get it scheduled, of course. Uh, to worry about the weather in, in England a little more than you have to uh, in, in some spots. And, and uh, Ms. Scott, that was kind of a, a concern you had uh, during your flight as well when you were there on vacation. And we were there 
it was toward the tail end of the, the vacation that I was scheduled to do this. And um, I just kept looking at the sky thinking, man, I hope this, I hope it clears up. And as you can see in the photos, the, the day we were there, it was gorgeous. It couldn't have been better, but it was on my mind. I didn't, you know, the English weather's notoriously bad and we were just lucky, lucky to get it in. It was gorgeous and uh, I had a blast, had a blast flying the airplane, you know, bucket list item. And uh, the CAF uh, has given me opportunities to do a lot of things that I never dreamed I would do, you know. I've, I've always wanted to be involved with something like this. And uh, I'd, I'd flown a C-46 commando with another nonprofit organization up in North Carolina. And I left that outfit and I, I fell right into the CAF at the right time. And uh, man, it's been, it's been incredible. I've worked on airplanes, old airplanes. I get to fly old airplanes. I get to talk about airplanes. I teach people about systems. We have a cadet program in the Gulf Coast Wing and I'm in charge of that. And these kids are working on their private pilot's written exam. I'm teaching ground school. We walk in the hangar. I let them stick the tanks on the B-17 to, to check the fuel quantities. I teach them how to check the oil. We do, there's photos of our cadets doing checklist procedures in the S&J cockpit. All the things we learn, but they're getting to learn this stuff in these old airplanes. That's uh, just a unique experience. I enjoy as an instructor, writing in their logbook that's going to be with them the rest of their days the fact that they got to do aircraft systems on a b-17 they know the hydraulics they know the power plant they know the fuel system yeah uh, it's just a, i'm just lucky to be in the right place at the right time with a lot of good people uh lynn root uh, our wing commander he's taught me in the beach 18 and the b-17 he's an excellent pilot excellent instructor john cotter our flight operations officer and in the C-45, Greg Downing up in Oklahoma, these people are far beyond my capabilities in these airplanes and I'm, I'm learning from them every time we fly. I'm just lucky to be here, man. It's, uh, it's a privilege. Well, and, and you, you bring up a really uh, excellent point with the commemorative Air Force. Not only are, are we uh, looking at looking back at history and honoring the men and women and the aircraft of, of the greatest generation, but also uh, as the CAF has moved forward is also kind of paying it forward, as you're mentioning with the uh, cadet program and uh, tr trying to inspire the next generation of mechanics and pilots who will continue flying these airplanes, hopefully for, for many, many years to come. Absolutely. You know, today a lot of kids are living in Xbox world and that's probably old school now. Uh, I watch, there's a flight, there's a big flight school where I, where the B-17 is based. And I, these kids are going through a professional pilot training program and they, they just walk right by the, the hangar. They're so focused on, you know, learning their ratings that they, they don't take time to smell the roses and look and see the history of this. It's right under their nose. Uh, I'm just lucky that these kids are doing this because they're, they are the next. We're handing off the torch to them. And uh, uh, without them carrying it on, it's not going to keep going. And uh, that's why it's so important. A lot of these kids that are, that are in the Gulf Coast wing, they have aspirations to be professional pilots, military pilots. And I've started the program based on my experiences as, as a cadet in the Civil Air Patrol back in the 70s. I was lucky to be in the squadron. I'm actually still in the same squadron. I'm, a, I'm an online aerospace education officer. Uh, but we had a flying program in the CAP. I learned to fly in CAP. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here today. It was uh, it's an auxiliary of the Air Force. And, uh, you know, I wore a flight suit. I use a checklist just like I do today in the airlines and, and the same thing in the B-17, same in the Beach 18. Uh, it was a great foundation and I'm, I'm trying to carry over a lot of that, that same kind of training uh, mentality into the CAF. The, the kids that are in the program, it's like the song, you can, you can dip your foot in the pool, but you can't have a swim. You're the fastest runner, but you can't win. Well, it's kind of that way with the cadets in the CAF, and understandably, because our airplanes are just, they're, you know, you can't put a price on them. They're priceless. You can't teach people the basic flying in a B-17. 
but the kids can learn about flying now through ground school. And we do have a, an independent program out. The flying itself is outside of the Gulf Coast wing and these kids can learn to fly. And we also have a corporate donation that helps offset some of their cost based on the amount of work they do in the CAF. So they, they work, they earn money to help pay for their flying and uh, it gives them an outlet to eventually come back and do what I'm doing now when I'm, when I'm no longer around. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a great program, and uh, obviously we uh, in CAF encourage you to can continue on, and and hopefully other uh, units will uh, will be able to pick up the torch as, as you have. And, and speaking of other units, we would be remiss if we didn't mention the fact that there there is a Spitfire within the uh, Commemorative Air Force itself. Uh, it's a uh, Mark Nine uh, with the uh, California uh, so Southern California wing, uh, and uh, you can see some photos of it there. It uh, is, uh, flies in. Uh, air shows and fly-ins uh, on the West Coast. Sometimes they can bring it the uh, other side of the mountains, but uh, mostly on the West Coast. So if you're in the uh, Los Angeles area, uh, Camarillo, California is where the uh, SoCal uh, unit is located. And they too, uh, just like the Gulf Coast Wing, have a very active uh, cadet program. Uh, these are some of the youth that have uh, helped out at the uh, SoCal Wing. Uh, there was a, a great contingent of uh, young the people. Gulf Coast Wing cadets. Oh, it is. Okay. Those are uh, yeah. Lessons. I was going to mention the, the uh, uh, Southern California cadets helped uh, get their uh, PBJ or, you know, the B-25 uh, Navy Marine Corps uh, variant uh, helped uh, extensively in that restoration. But uh, this is, uh, these are some of your cadets? Yes. Uh, okay. All these are, are Gulf Coast Wing cadets. That's Robert Beniva. And learning copy procedures, Weston Mounts, uh, JT Mounts, and uh, we've got Samantha uh, McKee, and we've got a couple other cadets that weren't there for that night. But, you know, they're, look what they get to do. They get to sit in the S&J. They get to learn systems. You know, I, I do a walk around. I teach them how to free flight an airplane and uh, B-17, S&J, and Beach 18. And we take we just finished a chapter on weather we've been beating weather up pretty good and it just so happens there's a Saab 340 sitting on the ramp we walk outside we look at the all the weather uh, anti-icing equipment on the airplane there's jets in the hangar we, we whatever is available we use it uh, we just went over flight physiology last class you know and uh, these kids soak this stuff up like you wouldn't believe and, and every kid in this photograph is an aspiring pilot in fact uh, Samantha, the the gal on the left, she's uh she's got she's enlisted in the army. She's got a some type of program in the army that's going to give her a commission and a flight a flight slot. Robert Beniva, the tallest kid on the right, uh, he's shooting for an Air Force pilot slot. And the west, the two guys in the middle are brothers, and they both want to. They're aspiring to be professional pilots. I mean. This is a blast. I just I get to go out there and, and I have to get to teach these kids all this stuff. And then it, the beautiful thing about being an instructor, one of the things I really like is kids that are not just kids, adults, too, that are that are wanting to learn, you know, and every one of them is highly motivated. They're they're intelligent. They're way smarter than I ever dreamed of being. And uh, they're, they're good kids. They work real hard when we have fly days. And uh, we've got a, a couple of others that aren't pictured but one of those is uh, shooting for the Air Force Academy she's she just interviewed uh, with an ROTC unit Air Force ROTC I mean not putting all her eggs in one basket and she's been offered scholarships to the Marine Corps um, so you know these these are the future these kids are the future well that's great and uh, we're uh... So pleased that they're a part of uh, the Gulf Coast Wing and that, that you're taking time to uh, to encourage them. And uh, just from the looks, I, I think uh, eh, maybe the future of the CF is in good hands already. Well, I appreciate that. I'm, I mean, I'm just the guy. I'm just doing what I what I what I was taught as a cadet myself in the Civil Air Patrol. I'm paying it back. And I, and I'm sure these kids, my only request from them is and I know this is corny, it's from a movie, but pay it forward. Right. They'll give back someday. They'll help somebody else down the line. That's all I ask. I don't want their money. 
just pay your dues for the CAF and show up and do your thing and carry it on. Well, we do have a, a question here. Uh, we're going to go back to uh, Biggin Hill. And uh, while uh, you and your wife were there, did, did you have an opportunity to meet uh, Mrs. Anna Walker, the world's only uh, female uh, hurricane pilot? No, I did not. Unfortunately, not. Wow, that would be a, that would be a story, I'm, I'm sure. Well, Scott, you know, to, to expand upon that, uh, there was an organization in England. Uh, it was similar to the WASP program in the United States, the Women's Air Service Pilots. It was, uh, but it was men and women that ferried airplanes all over the place. I can't remember the acronym, but but they were actually paid. Uh, but there there was a lady ferry pilot that actually ran into an uh, Mr. Smith 109, and she kind of just told him to go away. And I don't know why he didn't shoot her down, but uh, he let her go, and <laughs> that was the story. Well, good. Um, we, uh, I think we've covered all the questions that, that folks have, have uh, put in the chat box. If uh, you do have a question with the couple of minutes we have left here, please uh, go ahead and, and type it in. We'll, we'll uh, try to answer it for you. But uh, Scott, any, any final thoughts uh, that you have for us this evening? Oh, man. Just uh, if, you, if you've got the, the time and you're going to be in England, I highly recommend doing this. You know, one one last thought hotel van san antonio texas i'm going to work where i work flying in the airlines just me and the van driver he asked me a question what do you and this is a crazy this is a big question what do you think was the most important airplane in world war ii my mind instantly goes to the b-29 the atomic bomb but if you really think about it well and i took a couple of minutes before i gave him the answer you know, what, what would have happened if the Germans had invaded England? We wouldn't have had an aircraft carrier called England to launch into Normandy in 1944. So what prevented the Germans from coming across that channel? The RAF. You know, Hermann Goering said to a bunch of fighter pilots, what do you guys need to win the air war? And, and one of them said, a squadron of Spitfires. That's what he said to, to Goering. Uh, but since the hurricane, and I know we're talking about the Spitfire here, since the hurricane really shot down more Germans than the spit, I told the guy the Hawker hurricane. Um, but but really, I think there were 2,500 pilots in the RAF that were involved with this with this fight. And I think those, if it wasn't for the RAF, England would not have been a jumping off point, and the the World War II would have been a whole different ball game, because we would have had to come hit hit Europe through some other route. You know, it would have had to happen another way. But uh, the RAF, my hat's off to them. And they, you're talking guys that, that had nine hours of checkout time in a Spitfire. And they're going up against Germans that have been fighting since the Spanish Civil War. If you can last your first 10 missions as a fighter pilot, your situational awareness just expands where you, you, your survivability has increased dramatically. But uh, if you, you were cannon fodder, you know, you're a deer in the headlights, but those guys with very little experience, they overcame that, they got their experience, and they, they turned the tide. They kept the Germans from coming into England. So go to Biggin Hill. Even if you can't fly the airplane, go get a tour. Go see these people. And if you can if you can swing it to go fly some of these airplanes, and to my knowledge, they have a two-seat hurricane now, so you can fly in that as well. Uh, it's well worth the time. And oh, by the way, you can go see all that other stuff too, you know, London Bridge and all that. For me, don't tell my wife, but the spit part was the, <laughs> it was the, it was my main, my main thing, but uh, I enjoyed the rest of it too. Go over to Biggin Hill, enjoy yourself. There you go. A uh, couple of questions just, just coming in here briefly. Um, uh, one of our uh, viewers is very interested in your uh, uh, brief comparisons with the P-51. Our there are more similarities or differences between the two uh, from your experience. People have asked me that. They said, if you had to go to war, what would you fly, a P-51 or a Spitfire? And I say it's a P-51. The Achilles heel of the early models of the Spit, I believe I, did I mention that? It was the uh, 
the inability for the airplane to pull negative G's. It had a float carburetor. Later models had a modified carburetor, a Stromberg carburetor that, that you could do that with. But even still, it doesn't have an inverted oil system for the engine to my knowledge, and you would still run into trouble. Uh, the P-51 had greater range. It had six 50 caliber machine guns, which isn't a 20 millimeter cannon, but it's got a good punch, a lot of range. And um, I, I'd have to say the P-51, but you muscle that airplane around a lot more than you do a Spitfire. I mean, when I did four point rolls in the P-51, you take that flight control stick, you're, you're doing four turns like so and hesitating at each. You literally, as hard as you can slam that stick to its full roll motion, you do, and then you stop it. With the Spitfire, like it says in the Spitfire Mark V flight manual, it's a flick maneuver, just flick of the wrist. The P-51, you're muscling that airplane. Um, those are the, uh, those are the big differences. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, it looks like the Mark Nine has a five-bladed propeller. Earlier photos have four. Um, it was it, that's just the uh, development and evolution of of the design. I would assume so. Yeah. Um, I don't know. The engines progressively got bigger. I right. think. One of the last models that was used was the Seafire. It was a Navy model of the Spitfire, and it had a, a huge engine. And obviously, you know, metallurgy can only take so much stress. You got to divvy out the, the load on another propeller blade. That, that would be my guess. I'm not an expert on that area, but that would just be general, a general guess. Well, good. Well, again, Scott, we appreciate you uh, spending your time with us uh, tonight and uh, talking about uh, your flight in the Spitfire and, of, of course, the uh, the cadet program with the Gulf Coast Wing uh, and, of course, your recommendation to just go fly. And if you have to fly, go fly a Spitfire, right? Yeah, absolutely. Or the CAF. We, 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 we give rides in the B-17, the, the Beach 18, and the S&J. Come on down. Sounds good, and we look forward to uh, hopefully getting uh, some of our aircraft out on tour again this this year once uh, COVID kind of uh, settles down, and we'll look to see uh, Texas Raiders out there on the air show circuit as well. Yes, sir. Thanks a lot for for inviting me. I appreciate it, and I hope everybody that's watching learned a little bit, and I hope it was informative for you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Scott, and just want to uh, let you know what's coming up uh, next week. Uh, Stephen Bridgewater will be joining us uh, from England. Uh, it's actually a, a session that we recorded because of the time difference, uh, but you'll be able to see that on the CAF YouTube channel uh, next Wednesday night, 7 o'clock Central Time, and then the weekend, or uh, Wednesday after that, it's uh, Tora Tora Tora's Pyro Guru uh, Gordy Webb, who will uh, talk about the pyrotechnics that go into the uh, Torah show and, and also some of the uh, techniques and maybe a couple of secrets as to uh, how they make things go boom at air shows and we'll look forward to that on the uh, the 17th as always we appreciate you uh, joining us here at uh, the commemorative air force warbird tube our webinars are every wednesday evening at seven o'clock and until next week have a great week i'm steve bus